The public forum resolution for January is whether or not the United States federal government should end its economic sanctions against Venezuela. There's a couple things that I want to note about the resolution before we get started. The first is that the resolution requires the pro to advocate a change from the status quo. The resolution is not on balance or is the status quo good or on balance are sanctions on Venezuela desirable. It is whether or not the United States should lift sanctions and the pro needs to prove that there is a benefit from lifting that san those sanctions. Now, those wordings sound very similar, right? We had a, a wording uh, for November, December that asked the question of whether or not offensive cyber warfare uh, is desirable. And it kind of implicitly asked the question of whether or not the U.S. should stop offensive cyber warfare, but it didn't do that. It just said what we're doing currently is it on balance desirable? In this instance, the affirmative, since they have to advocate a policy change, is going to have to prove not only that the sanctions cause harm, but that repealing them would actually be beneficial. In other words, just because the sanctions may be applying added economic pressure or have caused some additional hyperinflation does not mean if we repeal them that the necessarily investment in Venezuela will increase or that Maduro uh, will, the president of Venezuela will react in a particular way. So it's just something to keep in mind as you move forward. It seems like it's not a significant difference at this time, but as we move through some of the arguments, you will see that it matters. The third thing I want to point out is that it is about U.S. economic sanctions. It's not about economic sanctions that any other country might have on Venezuela. Before we get started, I do want to talk now about what sanctions are. Basic definitions, such as this one from Wikipedia, say these sanctions decisions include the temporary imposition of a target of economic, trade, diplomatic, cultural, and other restrictions. So generally a restriction on interaction with the country. Um, these do not include war, as it says, but, you know, as noted in this resolution, it is economic sanctions. Those are the, the, that is the modifier. So you're talking about an economic interaction or a trade interaction. And that's what this resolution is about. Now, there are some uh, there is some evidence that talks about an, an embargo. An embargo is really a complete economic sanction, a complete block on trade that's usually even enforced by the military. Sanctions can be enforced by the, mil by the military, but usually are not or often are not enforced by the military. An embargo usually will be. The only difference really between a sanction and an embargo is the embargo is kind of complete, uh, a complete sanction, really like no trade uh, whatsoever between two countries. The U.S. has sanctions on Venezuela, but we currently do not have an embargo. There is some trade that is allowed. The other thing I want to point out about sanctions is that historically sanctions don't accomplish their intended purpose, which is usually the change in the regime. But they do have effects that are kind of, uh, you know, effects, consequences um, that can be debated. Uh, so sanctions have not produced regime change in Cuba, Iran, Syria, Egypt, Russia, North Korea, Iraq, and of course Venezuela. The U.S. has actually had an embargo on Cuba for the last uh, 50 years. And, uh, you know, there's been no change there. We've had the Castros um, in power uh, ever since the embargo was placed in Iran. Their economy is in terrible shape, but the uh, the theocratic regime uh, continues to survive. In Syria, of course, we have Assad who even gassed his own people. They're in the middle of the civil war, but they're back. So Assad is backed by Russia and he hasn't gone anywhere. Took us, we had sanctions on Egypt for a long time. We actually eventually militarily overthrew uh, Muammar Gaddafi, but um, it wasn't because of the sanctions in Russia. We placed sanctions on Russia to try to reduce their military aggression uh, in the Ukraine, and you know that hasn't reversed anything we've done there. There's obviously been nearly, uh, probably, arguably an embargo, but at least a massive, uh, massive economic sanctions on North Korea, where it's very, very difficult uh, for them to trade with the outside world. They continue their nuclear weapons development. They continue. Uh, you know, their leader continues to remain strong. We have Iraq. Uh, the U.S. had sanctions on Iraq for nearly a decade. Some people say they killed 400,000 people, but they didn't do anything to get rid of Saddam Hussein. What actually got rid of Saddam Hussein was the U.S. military, um, you know, initiative in the region to overthrow him. And then, of course, now we see in, in Venezuela, the current leader, Madero, um, before him, Chavez, we've had sanctions uh, for less of a period of time, but we started with sanctions around 2015, uh, and obviously the current leader is still in power and arguably increasing 
uh, his power. Just a few facts about Venezuela. The capital of Venezuela is Carcas. The currency is a bolivar. You'll read a lot and hear a lot about the currency because there's a lot of inflation um, in Venezuela, which makes it very difficult for there to be, uh, you know, any um, kind of current, any, any activity uh, in terms of kind of the economy, basically their currency is worthless. Some people say there's been inflation of a hunt, you know, the, the currency, of the 200,000 to a million uh, uh, percent increase in inflation every year. Um, it is located in, in South America. Um, it's bordered on the north by the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean, and it's bordered on the south by Brazil uh, and Colombia. You'll hear a lot about Colombia. There's a lot of debates about Colombia. Uh, issues will come up about Colombia because there's a lot of refugees. They're actually making their way into uh, into Colombia from uh, uh, from Venezuela. And that in addition to the humanitarian consequences, that hurts relations uh, between Colombia uh, between Colombia and Venezuela. Now, most of the people they do they do live in cities. It, it's very heavily urbanized. Uh, they have a high, then they also have a high amount of biodiversity, the seventh in the world, um, and they are. Uh, you know, there will be some debates related to that. Venezuela obviously has a long history, more than we're going to get into in this lecture. But the recent history is what's important. In 1998, it started with uh, Hugo Chavez, who launched the Bolivar Resolution Revolution of 1998, which was a socialist. Uh, revolution that nationalized industry, it raised taxes, it basically tried to implement a socialist utopia. Now, Venezuela has the world's largest oil resources. Um, it was kind of the founding, uh, the founding member of OPEC. It was actually the, the idea of the oil, their oil minister to found an organization of petroleum exporting countries. And in 2008, the price of oil in the world was very high. You're probably too young to remember, but at that time, um, gasoline was close to four dollars a gallon. Sometimes it even went above that. Oil prices were close to two hundred dollars a barrel. Um, so when they sold their oil on the markets, this kind of subsidized a generous social welfare program. Um, they even had subsidized energy exports to the U.S. to like help people in the U. Uh, poor people in the U.S. to kind of like make fun of the U.S. capitalist model. Now this made the rest of their economy kind of irrelevant. Um, they have all this oil. They became completely dependent on oil. They stopped worrying about how well to run the oil company. Uh, Chavez put in uh, place a lot of his supporters in high positions of power within the oil company, and he actually got rid of um, the, the people who actually knew how to run the oil company in exchange for his supporters. And they were kind of able to live, continue to live on this high. Um, some people actually call that a resource curse, right? They're able to live on all the soil that they have. Um, they didn't even have to worry about running the company well because the the profits to the uh, the profits were so high. But the problem that happened is that um, after 2008, once you get into 2009, 10, 11, okay, the price of oil went down dramatically. It didn't sustain this price of you know nearly a hundred dollars a barrel. And they only had one resource. They only had one thing to sell. They only really have one main industry in their economy, and they don't have people running the company who actually know what they're doing. So this kind of all collapsed. Their economy starts to unwind in like 2010, 2011. Um, now, while this is happening, um, you have the death of Chavez himself. He died a bit unexpectedly from cancer shortly after winning re-election. Um, and someone named Nicolas Maduro, who is the current president of Venezuela, he took over. Uh, Maduro continued Chavez's policy uh, policies, but the economy collapsed. They're really, uh, like I say, experiencing a depression. They have massive inflation of between 200,000 and a million percent. There's incredible food shortages. Uh, their medical systems basically completely collapsed. Um, you know, now there's sanctions, which are aggravating the situation. The oil prices are down, as I mentioned. Uh, the oil industry is a lot of trouble. It's so bad that there are a lot of people just fleeing Venezuela. Um, there's really evidence that 5 million people have already fled. They kind of like, as they say, they end up in Colombia. This is expected to grow uh, to 8 million uh, refugees. So the current situation, that's the current political situation, the current economic situation in Venezuela. Of course, like I said, you know, that has been aggravated by uh, the sanctions. So in terms of the sanctions, uh, Trump imposed sanctions in 2017. Um, there were some sanctions before that that I'll talk about, but these are significant because they targeted the oil industry, the PDVSA, which is their uh, one state-owned oil company. 
and it targeted Vene uh, certain Venezuelan officials like the finance minister, which obviously makes it a bit difficult to trade. Uh, this undermined the oil industry, uh, which, as I said, is their only real source of money. Uh, now, look, there were problems, of course, before these sanctions. You know, the, economically uh, speaking, a lot of the people who had money who were working in the oil industry at the time, they left. Uh, the, civil, the civil unrest means that people kind of want to leave. Um, so and there's just kind of a lack of talent and expertise, as I mentioned, within the oil industry itself. But certainly these sanctions aggravated the situations because they cannot be applied um, um, because, you know, it's just difficult for uh, much more difficult for Venezuela to sell its oil on the international markets. And of course, industries do not want to invest. Now, in terms of sanctions, the, we, the U.S. has sanctions on 88 uh, individuals and 46 en uh, entities from or related to Venezuela. You can see that in January, uh, March of 2015, I, will, I won't read you all these details, but the U.S. started kind of its uh, putting sanctions on um, uh, kind of Venezuela. And you can, if you want, you can download this slide presentation um, from, the, uh, from the internet there, from debateus.org. It's free and you can read through kind of the details of the progression, what was happening in Venezuela and the sanctions the U.S. was placing on Venezuela. Um, in July, in July of in in January of 2019, we can see an increase in uh, sanctions that were applied, um, you know, to the people within the administration beyond what was already there. We then sanctioned a mining company. I'll talk about mining in a bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of shipping companies or some shipping companies or shipping oil sanctions on them. So the U.S. is kind of continuing to escalate the sanctions. And there's evidence that says the U.S. will add even more sanctions this year as we move into the new year. Now, why are the sanctions bad? What are the pro contentions? Well, it kind of varies. There are certain reasons that the sanctions are bad. Some people will make these uh, break down these arguments, and I'll talk about them here in a second. Um, they might make individual contentions out of any of these points, A, B, C, D, and E, or they kind of might put them together. Um, but these kind of these first set of arguments kind of really show kind of the economic harms on um, the subsequent humanitarian harms from the sanctions. So first of all, some people will say the oil industry has been undermined. That the oil industry is critical to the economy. Um, other people will say it's kind of tough to import medicines. Um, medicines and food, right, as we see and see, are not explicitly prohibited from trade in any way by the sanctions. But when you have sanctions on financing, when you have sanctions on making other trade agreements, a lot of banks don't want to finance the export of the food to be sold or medicine to be sold in Venezuela. Other people are just wary of entering into con contracts and fear that the sanctions will kind of be applied to them and they will have to pay an economic penalty. So even in, even in areas where uh, trade is permitted, it's, it's difficult sometimes to get people to engage in the trade. Uh, because they're afraid of the sanctions. And there are also uh, sanctions on what are called clap boxes, which are basically just boxes of food that the government distributes, you know, depending on how you look at it to help people meet their basic needs. It does do that. They may have political motives for that. But the food that's imported, uh, excuse me, the food that's in the boxes is often imported. Um, and the U.S. has placed sanctions on the people in the regime who engage in the trade to get this food into the clap boxes and other supplies because they think that the U.S. or excuse me, because they think there's a lot of corruption in this program um, and that it's benefiting these people in the regime at the expense of the people. But there are arguably uh, sanctions on the, these clap boxes. And some people say this makes it difficult for six million people to access the material inside the clap boxes. And this is a common separate contention. All the other people say it means that, look, that right now Venezuela can't get access to capital, can't get access to money. It needs to refinance its debt. And it's very difficult. The argument is that it's very difficult for Venezuela to continue um, to pay off its debt, that right now it's defaulted on some of its debt. And in other instances for the debt, there's just very high interest that they have to pay on the debt itself and that this debt is strangling their economy and if they because there are sanctions uh, they can't get access uh, to any way to refinance the debt um, but if the sanctions are lifted they could um, and that this will uh, you know uh, kind of reduce the debt pressure on the economy in terms of an impact people kind of talk about structural violence that's becoming a little more 
popular in PF, just kind of all the, the economic kind of struck, you know, to say, look, given the way this economy is structured, that's impoverishing and, you know, hurting a lot of people. The people say, we'll say it's immoral. There's also some people say there's a diversionary war that Madero might engage in. If there's too much political pressure, he'll try to rally uh, Venezuela nationalism by launching a war against Venezuela. There is a study that claims that the sanctions, even when you account for the other factors, uh, kill like up to 40,000 people and that more kind of will continue to die. Now, why are the sanctions bad? Again, continued disease. Um, so some evidence says that the healthcare system has been largely undermined. Their economy is bad, so we can't finance it. There's no access to medicine. Um, also, a lot of these refugees obviously get sick, right? They kind of uh, they, they get a disease, but they don't get any treatment because they're on the move, which means that you have people, millions of people all over South America who don't have any access to medical care, kind of on the move that this is spreading disease. Uh, there's an argument about gold mining, which some people actually make into a separate contention. Uh, the argument is, is uh, and it's very similar to drug trafficking, the argument is that people with people in the regime, because they can't, uh, uh, you know, people within the regime that powerful power, people who are economically powerful within Venezuela, uh, they can't engage in legitimate business, or at least it's very difficult for them to engage in legitimate business because of the because of the sanctions. So as a result, they they turn to illegal gold mining, um, which is done in you know environmentally sensitive places at great depths. Um, they take this gold, they have it exported to Turkey, but these are this is very um, it's very bad for the environment and it hurts people's health. People, a lot of people contact tuberculosis and other forms of diseases engaging in this gold mining, and similarly that these people uh, turn to drug trafficking uh, to support kind of their uh, their economic needs. Um, so you can kind of relate that to disease or you can make that into a separate contention. Some people do make that gold mining argument into a separate contention. Um, then they also say that what can happen is that the peace talks collapse, that the, the, the peace talks between Venice, uh, that there were peace talks between uh, Madero, the government and the opposition. And at first I thought this was a pretty good argument. There's kind of there we're going to have like some talks. And then when the U.S. put on those oil sanctions, Madero said, oh, I'm not going to have the talks anymore because the U.S. put on sanctions. I mean, obviously, if you look into it a little bit more, it's not that strong of an argument that, the you know, this is a bit of political posturing. Madero didn't necessarily want to engage uh, in these talks to begin with. So then when the U.S. put on the sanctions, he blamed it on the sanctions. It's also the case that just because they have these talks doesn't mean that any agreement is going to result. I mean, the opposition obviously kind of their final outcome is they want Madero to leave, but Madero uh, is not going to leave. So that kind of undermines that a lot. There's also evidence that says, look, if the U.S. just ended the sanctions, if we just flat ended the sanctions, um, then what would happen is that the uh, uh, Madero wouldn't have any incentive to gauge, engage in the talks anymore. And that, yes, we should consider lifting the sanctions, but only if there are peace talks first. So this argument, um, it's not really that strong. Um, other people make arguments about how the sanctions violate international law, that they're offensive to human rights. Um, these arguments are a little more difficult to win in public forum debate. People like more like kind of direct consequential impacts. But there are there is evidence related to that. Uh, some people argue that Trump is bad and that it would be good if he lost the 2020 election. What does that have to do with the topic? The argument is that a lot of people who have fled Venezuela and other similar regimes, such as those in Cuba, um, that they've moved into southern Florida. Um, and that, as we know, Florida is, is very important uh, to the election, that Florida can essentially determine the out outcome of an election. It's a critical swing state with a lot of votes. It's always super close. And that if sanctions were lifted, this would be blamed on Trump and that he would lose Florida and consequently the election. And they say it's good for Trump to lose the election because if Trump loses the election, then we um, um, we'll, we'll go back into compliance with the Paris Accords on climate change and that it's good to comply with the Paris Accords on climate change. Obviously, the you know, the con could read this on the other side and say it's bad for Trump to lose the election, but it, it was run as a pro-contention um, at Blake. 
You can make geopolitical arguments. You'd say, look, it's bad for the U.S. to have put on these sanctions because this just increases the influence of Russia, China, and Iran and Venezuela. You can make arguments about how this is a threat to U.S. security. Uh, these arguments weren't really very popular at Blake or other tournaments. Um, you know, their arguments about, you know, these arguments are all related to geopolitical positioning and influence. Uh, these arguments can be hard to win in public forum debate. Again, people like kind of quantifiable impacts, uh, which is why, you know, kind of on, a, on the Belt and Road topic, we ended up debating about uh, a trade war between the U.S. and Europe and like why that, uh, how that might cause a recession, even though that argument, that topic was really um, you know, if you read the core literature, it was really about geopolitics. It's just kind of hard to make uh, those arguments relevant in public forum debate. And even if they were more relevant, honestly, these arguments are not uh, that great. I mean, China's influence in Venezuela, you know, they're, um, they would like more influence. They are kind of building some ties in Venezuela and might as well try to do something, you know, to at the expense of the U.S. when the U.S. is hurting itself. But honestly, they're also like, you know, they're, they're a little gun shy. Venezuela's economy is bad. They don't want their companies to get tangled up in any of these sanctions. There's not a ton for them to gain because Venezuela's oils industry is weak, right? So it's not like there's all this oil there to be taken and used by uh, China. They do import some of the oil, but it's relatively trivial uh, given to their, give, uh, compared to their total uh, oil kind of consumption. There's also kind of questions that, you know, um, Iran's influence. Iran has their own problems. The most influential country is probably Russia. Um, they are supporting and backing the regime, but um, it's not really that significant. But these are arguments that you should, um, you know, you should kind of keep an eye out for and be prepared to debate. Now, the main kind of reason we have these sanctions is that, you know, the U.S. wants to overthrow Maduro. So let's talk about briefly with some problems with the cons. Uh, Madero bad argument. The biggest problem, I think, is just uniqueness. Um, Madero's power is actually increasing. Uh, the opposition is kind of falling apart. Protests are decreasing. Uh, Gaida, who is the main opposition uh, uh, candidate who the U.S. kind of essentially recognized over the summer as the president of Venezuela, uh, his credibility is decreasing due to a scandal. Most of the military that was opposed uh, to Madero has fled. The country opposition leaders um, are arrested. Uh, if this was the summer of 2019, uh, this argument would be a lot better. At that point, there was kind of a, probably was an attempted military coup where the U.S. backed uh, Guaida in opposition was strong. But ever since that happened, um, you know, Madero was not overthrown. A lot of those people in the military have left the country. The number of protests are decreasing. The opposition has given up all the recent evidence really says that the uh, Madero is kind of not uh, under any kind of threat at all. So that's something, it's something you want to pay attention to when you're debating the other teams and kind of the dates on their evidence. When is it talking about? If it's from the fall of this year, the evidence is probably old. Um, the other thing is Madero, of course, can sustain his regime, as I just talked about, from support, especially from Russia, some from China, maybe a little bit from Iran, and then you have the gold trade with Turkey. It's not great, but it enables them to gather resources and hang on. Um, you know, as we note in number eight, they also kind of uh, engage in narcotics trade. Um, there's also evidence of kind of a couple turns that some teams actually cause some people to Madero to actually read the Madero argument on the pro. They say that the sanctions mean the regime like hoards all the resources. So what essentially happens is you have disproportionate uh, the sanctions undermine the general economy and mean the average person can't gain access to the resources. But the regime itself, like get plenty, uh, you know, they have the capability, the people like, you know, I'm saying when I say the regime, I mean, Madero and people, uh, people within his government that he supports and to support him and other economic elites in the country. They uh, can gauge in illegal activity, including the gold trade, narcotics trade, just other trade um, and generally that's illegal. And they are able to hold all the resources. And this gives them power relative to other people. Maduro, of course, can blame the U.S. for the economic problems, right? So the economic problems are not resulting in the overthrow of Maduro because this is what's happening. And we've seen this in other countries. People say, look, the reason why our economy is bad, the U.S. has placed the sanctions on, the, on us. It's not my fault. It's the U.S.'s fault, right? And it really allows uh, leaders like such as Maduro to increase nationalism. Uh, there's good evidence that says the military has basically been bought off by Maduro, so they have an economic in interest in not overthrowing him. 
Uh, the government's engaged in a lot of repression, just arresting people, killing people in the opposition. Um, there's good evidence that says the opposition, uh, like, look, people have left. Who's leaving? The opposition. People don't want to live in Venezuela anymore. Five million people have already left. It's projected that three million more will leave. That undermines, you know, the opposition that m remains within Venezuela. Um, you can also kind of, you know, you can also make the argument that sanctions, as I mentioned earlier, kill negotiations between Nadero and the opposition, which is kind of use it as another kind of indirect turn. So this argument is just it, it's obviously the, it, it's kind of tricky because it's the main reason that we do have sanctions on Venezuela. But arguing that sanctions lead to the overthrow of Madero is a very difficult uh, argument to win. And I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it. So with that said, what can the con uh, win? Well, I mean, they can argue Madero is bad. Some teams will do this. Um, some teams are okay at, at winning this argument. They're, what they're really talking about when they go for this argument to try to win the debate on it is they'll say, okay, Madero hasn't been overthrown yet. He will be overthrown in the future, that the U.S. will continue to ratchet up the pressure, um, and this will put more and more pressure uh, on Madero, um, and eventually he will go. Now, there's a couple problems with this argument. First of all, remember, the in the future, uh, the future... Uh, the trend is that Madero's power is increasing and the opposition is decreasing, not in the other direction. And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the historical trend is just that these things, uh, these sanctions do not really work, that they're not um, effective. They never lead to uh, leaders being overthrown. Um, but, you know, you can try your best if you're really kind of committed to defending the reasons for the sanctions. Uh, you can do that, of course, if you want. You just make sure that as I just flip back to that slide there briefly, that you are prepared to answer all 10 of those arguments um, that I just talked about in that previous slide. And again, you can download this slide presentation uh, from the Internet. There's arguments about U.S.-Latin American relations. Most countries in Latin America do support the sanctions on Madero. They do not like Madero, they think it's, he's destroyed the economy, he's created all these refugees in security situations. This is unlike the sanctions on Cuba, where most countries uh, in South America are opposed to them. But you could talk about why it's important for the U.S. to have strong relations with Latin American countries. In particular, Colombia would obviously be very upset if the U.S. lifted sanctions on the Madero regime, right? They, they, want, Madero, they want Madero to, not only do they want Madero, uh, to kind of be overthrown or to no longer be the president. But the, they've been engaging in a series of coordinated actions with the United States to increase pressure on Madero. So just, and, I, and I say recently, I mean <laughs> within the month of December. So if the U.S. just kind of made a you know 100 percent about face and decided to lift the sanctions on Venezuela, Colombia would uh, not only be unhappy, but they probably no longer see the United States as a reliable partner, less likely to engage in things that are even in their own interests, like security cooperation, environmental cooperation, economic cooperation, rule of law cooperation. We do have a lot of programs with Colombia. I mean, these arguably, of course, benefit Colombia as well, but if they're not going to see us as a reliable partner, they're not going to want to continue them. And there's obviously people within the Colombian government are probably opposed and now really going to rally kind of opposition to the United States. So I think that's a reasonable argument. Other people argue without sanctions that the U.S. will invade um, the U.S. will invade uh, uh, Venezuela. Uh, the U.S. considered doing this in the summer, actually uh, kind of a military invasion of Venezuela. Now, of course, what happened was that uh, this was largely supported by the National Security Advisor at that time, Bolton. Uh, Bolton's been removed by Trump for one of the reasons was that Trump thought he was too militarily aggressive. He also kind of wanted wars against North Korea and Iran. So the the you know how much political support there is for U.S. invasion uh, is probably limited. Venezuela is a large country; they have a huge military. Uh, you know, 100,000 plus soldiers. So this would be quite a war uh, for the United States to take on. It would be a massive. A military inven intervention, uh, consume a lot of resources. It would, U.S., of course, would win in the end, but it would be a very, very tough uh, fight. So this, it's probably, um, it's certainly possible that we would invade without it, but um, it's probably unlikely. There's also, some teams argue that Colombia will invade uh, Venezuela. Um, this is even, I mean, uh, Colombia at least is right next door, but again, it would be a, a considerable fight uh, for Colombia, there would be more refugees that uh, poured from Venezuela into Colombia. 
So it's not clear why Colombia uh, would want that. Also, the evidence uh, people have, have have shown for this argument uh, doesn't really say much of anything. It just kind of says that Colombia doesn't like refugees. They think refugees are an existential threat. They don't like Madero. And then they kind of leap from that to say that Colombia would invade. Um, and then they also say that Colombia would invade because they have the complete backing. They know they're backed by the United States. I mean, that may be true in the status quo, but if you think about it, if the U.S. lifted uh, sanctions on Venezuela, then Colombia would probably think that we don't have their back, that we now support Madero or at least willing to tolerate him, uh, not that we would want Colombia to invade. Um, so there's some weakness there. There's the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Some people say it would be bad for uh, Venezuela to be able to access kind of more capital and more lending. Uh, through the International Monetary Fund if sanctions were lifted because what would happen is that the IMF, they impose very strong conditions. They essentially come in, the IMF gives you big loans, and they start kind of managing your economy and telling you uh, what you can spend your money on. And a lot of the, the things that get cut back are social services uh, to the poor. The public sector gets reduced, right? The IMF is a free market institution, and they want to make sure that they can get paid for the money that they just lent you. Uh, so some people argue it's bad to have those cutbacks in the services. Now, in Venezuela's case, the economy is absolutely so bad, it's hard to imagine that things could get much worse, um, but they potentially could. Um, so teams make this IMF bad argument. Other teams make an argument that low oil prices are bad. They argue that if Venezuela increases, um, they argue that if Venezuela increases uh, its oil production and exports more oil to the market, that this will actually lower the global price of oil. This could hurt the uh, the economies of other countries such as Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. It could result in increased energy consumption. If prices go down, maybe more global warming. Uh, this is a popular argument in public forums, so it's not surprising, uh, you know, over the last few years. So it's not surprising that we see this argument. And look, you can make an argument about whether or not this is going to actually benefit the oil industry. The flip side of this is that, like, hey, it's not going to produce a huge benefit. There's evidence that says it's only impacted the price of oil globally by $2. I mean, it's obviously significant, you know, for buyers over millions of barrels, but it's not it's not that big of a deal. It probably doesn't impact energy consumption patterns, even if people have to pay a little bit more. There's also evidence that just says it'll take forever to rebuild uh, Venezuela's oil infrastructure. Um, there were 1.70 thousand people working in the oil industry. A lot of them were very highly qualified. Remember, Maduro got rid of the highly qualified people. The economy collapsed. So basically, the professional class, all the engineers, they've all fled uh, Venezuela. And there's really you no, know, uh, just because the U.S. lists sanctions, that doesn't mean they're going to go back. Maduro would still be in power, right? So this would be, um, it's unclear, like, would people want to invest in an industry that's one industry when the company is just owned by the government and, uh, you know, they get rid of all the qualified people. So there's evidence that just says that this industry has been devastated, that's actually the oil industry has been devastated, that it's that it's suffering more than uh, the Iraq's oil industry even did at the end of the Gulf War. Um, and it took 15 years to rebuild that oil industry. So good chance it would take a long time to do that. Uh, the most popular argument that people read on the con is this marketization good or dollarization good argument. And there's an article in the December 25th Washington Post that kind of makes this argument like in a, in a rather concise manner that you want to might want to check out. But the argument is that maybe the sanctions haven't worked to kind of get rid of the regime, but the sanctions have in this economic situation has put pressure on Madero to at least open the economy a little bit in terms of allowing some free market activity. Remember that Madero got rid of the free market activity even before the sanctions were in place and the economy really started to fall. So maybe keeping the sanctions on forces him to open up the economy a little bit and generate some economic activity to control inflation. Okay, and then you can couple this with an argument that says, look, if we just lifted the sanctions, he no longer have that incentive anymore. And all the other, you know, parts of socialism that he's instituted, these super high tax rates, this nationalization of industry would continue to exist. Right. Because we wouldn't have status quo trends towards more, more market pressure. All of this would continue to exist. It would potentially um even get worse because he no longer has that incentive. And then a related argument is dollarization. Dollarization says that because their currency completely collapsed, 
um, that more trade is occurring or more economic activity within the country and trade where it does happen abroad is occurring in dollars because the U.S. dollar is, you know, it's a pretty predictable currency. Its value is not going to radically fluctuate. If somebody pays you in dollars, you're not just going to suddenly have money that's worthless. And that because of the economic opening, because of, because of the pressure of the sanctions, the economic downturn, Maduro's even kind of allowed some more trade and or more trade to occur in dollars. And there's evidence that says like when Ecuador adopted the dollar, some other countries adopted the dollar, that this actually solved kind of this hyperinflation in these in their countries. So a lot of people are especially making this dollarization argument. It's arguably the most popular con argument. So it's something that you really uh, need to get prepared to debate. And there is evidence on the files on, on both of this, whether it can solve or not. One big problem with this argument is that it's not clear that if we lifted the sanctions, that Madero would reverse the dollarization because obviously um, he's allowed it uh, now uh, and probably not just because of the, the because of the sanctions, but also because the Bolivar is essentially worthless. And even if the U.S. lifted the sanctions, the Bolivar uh, would continue to be worthless. So um, there's a lot of kind of this dollar. Uh, so it's unclear. Remember to go back to the beginning, the, the beginning discussion, the lecture, uh, just because maybe sanctions are producing a, an effect. Does it mean re removing removing those sanctions necessarily change things? Uh, there's also a debate about dollarization, about whether or not it just means that the wealthy people or wealthier people in Venezuela can gain access to the dollar and all the poor people still have the Bolivar. But there's more recent evidence that says even kind of more of the lower level transactions, even lower classes in uh, Venezuela are gaining access to the dollar. So this is something, this marketization and dollarization is something that you very much need uh, to be prepared to debate. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, there are, you know, this topic is pretty good. There are some, in the sense that there are some strong arguments on both sides. Now, there are also a lot of answers to those arguments that weaken them. So it is hard for people, both the pro and the con, to kind of win the original contentions that they made. But um, it certainly, uh, and then as a result, a lot of the debates that are won are won on kind of a little bit of add-on arguments that people read in rebuttals or turns. So a lot of times this marketization or dollarization stuff is not even read by con teams as a contention. It's usually read as like turns to like humanitarian um, advantages and economy advantages like we talked about earlier. So um, so that's kind of one thing in terms of how the topic plays out and where you need to pay attention to these arguments. But good luck with your uh, January debates.